President. After exhaustive efforts by education leaders and stakeholders across the state, I am pleased to bring you the fruits of their labor, Senate Bill 2151. As you remember last session, we mandated that the Superintendent of Public Instruction convene meetings with early childhood education leaders from across the state representing all size communities. Those approximately 40 individual volunteers participated formally and numerous others added their perspectives. It was a great process and the work product before you is Senate Bill 2151. I would also be remiss, Mr. President, if I didn't note that there was some great input and some enhancements, improvements made by members of the Senate Education and members of the Senate Appropriation Committee, but I would also like to give the tip of the hat to the uh, members from District, the Senators from District 7 and 23 who have been amazing throughout this process. The bill will focus on four-year-old children and will allow a smooth transition to kindergarten without any gaps. The proposed legislation will appropriate $6 million in state funds. The funding will begin the second year of the biennium, which will allow districts and providers adequate time to develop quality programs that will both teach children as well as prepare them developmentally. This will allow a seamless transition from this program into our all-day kindergarten program. The program will provide scholarship grants of $1,000 per child, which will cover about half the cost of a program. The proposal will also provide $1,500 for eligible child from lower income families as defined by the Richard B. Russell Free and Reduced Designation to ensure that this program is available to as wide of audience as possible. So to be clear, the money or the funds follow the child to the provider, much like we do with our merit scholarship program where the dollars follow the student to the North Dakota College of their choice. It is important to note that this program is available for both public and private providers in the state. To help ensure quality programs, the proposal requires at least 400 hours of contact time spread out over 32 weeks, which is about seven months. This translates to a floor of about 12 hours per week. It gives them flexibility in terms of scheduling because they can do morning sessions and afternoon sessions with split cohorts. This translates to a four, um, and then it also requires within its curriculum at least 10 hours of research-based parental involvement. It is important to note that attendance by children is not mandatory or required. This is a voluntary program where the children will only go if their parents wish them to go. Well, this will have a strong edu education focus, I would be remiss if, that, if I did not mention that it will provide great financial support for working families in the state. I'm hearing from parents across the state that this bill will allow more individuals to either enter the workforce or increase their hours of part-time or full-time work. This is a vital consideration as we look to fill the more than 20,000 job openings in the state. We also know that nearly 80% of four-year-olds have both parents working outside the home. Senate Bill 2151 will be a great asset to those taxpaying working parents whose work is vital to our economy and to provide a good environment for their children when they're working. Section one of the bill uh, requires that the providers provide a teacher who is licensed in early childhood education in North Dakota. If you turn to page two of the bill, you will see one of the great ideas that came out of the interim work is the concept of using community coalition. These community coalitions will develop one or more plans and applications which must be submitted and approved by the state before the provider is eligible to receive money on behalf of the child and their family. So as an example, in Bismarck you could have one program provided by the local school district and one provided by a school, private school and one pr by a private community organization. This will greatly help school, with school districts that have limited physical capacity. Now if you flip over to page three, you will see that these payments will be made to providers once per quarter and those providers must provide documentation of the child's family that the state payments have been received. If the provider fails to give that, they uh, have sanctions as found on page three. Section six near the bottom of page four carries the language for the $6 million appropriation. And then finally, at the bottom of page four, you will see that the payments begin the second year of the biennium. Please note, that the work of the community coalitions will begin in, in year one in order to ensure that they have plans in place at the start of the second year of the biennium. Currently, over 70 school districts have these in place, in programs in place. Uh, Mr. President, this bill is about kids and their families, and I think it'll have a 
much, it'll produce a much greater future for the state of North Dakota. And I ask for your green light. Further discussion? Further discussion? Senator Heckman. Mr. President, um, Senate Bill 2151 is a bill I think we can all support. The benefits of this bill will be far-reaching. Extending opportunities to growing minds is so important. Families will see that the North Dakota Legislature is with them in understanding the importance of early intervention. Children accessing this program will come from all different socioeconomic situations. And in my experience teaching, I've found that children who benefit don't always come from low-income families. Interventions are needed across all socioeconomic situations. The children I served in my many years of teaching were children of nurses, bankers, judges, teachers, and many others who were not low income. This bill will benefit them as well as having the program available to low income families. And I believe this will give communities who do not have early childhood education programs incentives to build those programs. Not all of us live in communities with child care centers, and this bill will also provide opportunities for the providers, schools, and other facilities to work together in that community coalition. I recently received a phone call from a school board member, and he said, uh, Senator, I suppose you know we are of different party affili affiliations, and I said, I know that. And he said, um, I know you understand my previous philosophy on early childhood education. I didn't believe in it. And I said, I know that. And he said, I want to tell you right now that I've changed my philosophy. And I said, I'm glad. His philosophy was changed because of the program that we allowed schools to use over the last biennium. And although the school is using their own resources, he's found this program to be, be, be very beneficial. And he encouraged the legislature to do more for early childhood intervention. So Mr. President, with the passage of 2151, children will benefit, schools will benefit, and the state will benefit because early intervention is cost effective. And I certainly encourage red lights on this bill. Senator Pullman. Green. It's me, green lights. I was looking at my red light here. Going once, going twice. <laughs> Senator Pullman. Mr. President, this bill ultimately is about access, and increasing access to early childhood education is going to pay off in the long run. What we knew two years ago, anecdotally, is that in rural North Dakota, some schools were using Title I funds in order to create preschool programs. What ended up happening is that after they had those programs for a couple of years, they no longer qualified for Title I funding because they didn't have those struggling readers anymore. We now know multiple studies across the country are coming out saying that reduction in diagnosis as a special education or a special needs student has re been reduced by 40% as a result of uh, early childhood education and early intervention. And so I think that ultimately this is about increasing access, not just for low-income children, but for our rural children as well. We have plenty of programs where parents are trying very hard to create and maintain programs, selling calendars and brownies and cookies, trying to keep a program alive. A thousand dollar per student infusion into these programs will be uh, a game changer for them. And so I would appreciate a green vote on this. It's going to pay off in the long run in terms of special education costs. And it is going to ensure that our kids who many times come in up to two years behind if they haven't had any sort of early childhood education. It's going to allow them to come into school prepared and feeling like school is a good place for them. So I would also encourage a green light. Senator Triplett. Mr. President, I, um, I'm standing to speak in opposition to this bill with a heavy heart. I, um, and still a gravelly voice, sorry. I um, have long been a proponent of early childhood education, and I agree with everything the previous speaker said regarding the benefits of early childhood education, and I agree with everything the carrier of the bill said, with one exception, and that is the funding mechanism. Um, 
This is a program that's going to be run through our Department of Public Instruction as part of uh, an extension of the K-12 um, school uh, curriculum process. And we are, we are proposing to pay for it with a voucher program that um, will follow the student and be available equally to public and private sources of, of education. North Dakota prides itself on its public schools and we are distinct from many other states in that we have managed, sometimes with difficulty, not always evenly across the board, but we have managed to maintain a public school system with an enormous amount of integrity. And this is not the, the case in many other states where um, the public school systems have suffered from lack of support and there is an enormous and widespread um, um, effort to further degrade the public school systems across our country um, by voucher systems that promote public schools, or excuse me, that promote private schools, whether uh, religious or secular, um, as an alternative to a public education. And I consider this, that proverbial camel's nose under the tent that we all love to, to use as a phrase. Um, I, the carrier mentioned that this is the same as what we do in providing scholarships, um, but I consider that to be quite a different uh, set of circumstances. We, we are not obliged to provide scholarships to um, any of our students. We do that as a choice as we can afford it at the legislative level. We are obliged to provide um, by our constitution a free public education to all of our um, elementary and secondary students. And we um, have sometimes as a state struggled mightily to do that. Um, we have sometimes fallen far short of the mark, but we have always kept it within um, the goal of the legislature to fund public education with public dollars. And I think that this is just the wrong funding mechanism. So while I may be the only red vote in the, in the chamber, um, I am going to vote against this bill, and I would certainly hope that when it goes to the House side that there is some serious thought given to whether we want to start using public dollars to fund private um, education through our Department of Public Instruction. I think it's the wrong funding mechanism. I would encourage a few additional red votes. Senator Wardner. Mr. President, members of the Senate, uh, the concerns of the previous speaker, I would echo, I'm concerned about those things too. But I think this particular piece of legislation uh, is in good hands. And I don't think we'll see the camel's head under the tent go any further. And I hope it isn't under the tent. It's, I think it's probably the right thing to do. We're, uh, we're at a stage in education where we can provide uh, this pre-kindergarten education to all kids. Uh, over on the other side, and I know it's a little different group, but we have the Head Start, and we have many uh, children that are involved there. And some of them, and I know not many of them, but some of those children that go to Head Start do end up in private schools. So I think uh, that in this case, we're all right. And I would hope that we can support this legislation. Senator Schneider. Mr. President, I also appreciate the comments of the Senator from District 18. I thought they were very thoughtfully made. Uh, however, I, I will be voting in favor of this legislation as something to improve upon. Uh, for years now, North Dakota has been lagging behind other states, you know, a couple others just off the top of my head, Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma, uh, when it comes to providing access to early childhood education for our youngest and, and cutest and most adorable residents, Mr. President. And so I'm hopeful that as we pass this on, this is something uh, to build on and, and that will lead to a better future for our kids and a stronger education system here in North Dakota. So I'll be casting a, a green vote. Senator Mather. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
One of the lacks in this bill, I think, is the fact that there are 6,000 children left out. Uh, this basically will cover about 6,000. I think we have about 12,000 in the state um, that could benefit from this service. So I think that's a major problem in this bill. However, I also believe this will create the demand. It won't be long before families will say, why can't my kids take part in this program? Because they're going to see their neighbors in the program. They're going to hear about their relatives in another town. And that's going to create the demand. And people are going to demand that of the legislature to treat all children the same. And uh, this bill, as I see, is a step towards that. Senator Wanzik. Mr. President and members of the Senate, I personally see this in my mind because of the way it's structured a, a better solution to addressing the pre-K situation. But I'm still not quite sure whether I'm going to vote for it or not. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to stand and rise and be in opposition to a program that is meant for children. It's as if you're making a statement that you don't care about children and nothing could be further from the truth. But I do believe it is a fair question to ask. At what point does it become the taxpayer's responsibility rather than the parent's responsibility? And I struggle with that. Since I've been in this body, we have gone from not funding kindergarten to fully funding kindergarten. This is just the beginning now to fully funding, in my mind, eventually a preschool public program. And I wonder where it will go from there. I think one could possibly make the same argument about needing to get to these children at two years old and for the very same reasons. And I will just contend that money invested in parents still trumps anything we could do for our children. Um, we will never replace a good set of parents, in my opinion, by a government policy. And that's my struggle. I know this is meant to help parents with their children. And because it is a program that directs the money to the children in the program, I do believe makes it a better bill. But I still struggle with that question. When is it the taxpayer's responsibility rather than the parent's responsibility? When does that shift and at what age? Senator Dever. Mr. President, I was going to ask a question, but I, I think rather uh, if somebody would like to challenge my assumption, they're, they're welcome to. It seems to me that $6 million applied to one year of this biennium means $12 million to, as a cost to continue in the next biennium. As I look at the uh, fiscal note, I see it says the bill may have an impact on districts and cities as the appropriation only covers a portion of the cost for an early childhood program. The actual fiscal impact is unknown. So I don't think we at this point know what this is going to cost, so I'm going to vote no. Senator Flackle. Oh, there go my brains. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I'll try to provide some feedback on some of the things that have been asked or otherwise. Um, to the one question about the numbers, that was based upon what the Department of Public Instruction felt would participate in the second year of the biennium. So that's why that number was, was picked. Uh, I was visiting with a good friend of mine last night who asked the question about the funds, which is obviously a common question that's asked. If we were to take the Common Schools Trust Fund income alone, the difference between the current biennium we're in and the, last bi or the upcoming biennium, we would only need about 6% of that amount to cover this. So those things that are growing like that will more than compensate for any changes in, that we need in terms of financial amounts. So there are provisions that would allow for that. The question was brought up about uh, just with having it at public schools. Well, the challenge is that then we would be leaving many children out because some of those high growth schools, which we've talked about, 
uh, really a, a Watford City is a prime example. They really will need to partner up with private folks in the development of their programs because they have capacity challenges. And one of the nice things about this age group of children is that they're smaller groups so they don't have to have uh, so-called larger education environments. So that will be uh, important to some of those uh, schools or, or growing schools and smaller schools. The um, other part, and I, you know, I think the data is irrefutable in terms of what allowing greater access to voluntary education, uh, childhood education, because it can really change North Dakota forever. The statistics are overwhelming, and I'll just share some with you. Children who receive an education, early education, require less remediation in grade school. By the second grade, they perform 25% better on math, 20% better on English, and 30% are more likely to graduate. So that really dispels the myth, and it is a myth that by the time they're in third or fourth grade, that all effects are lost. When you, again, to reiterate, 30% more are likely to graduate from high school. And they're also 32% less likely to be arrested as a juvenile. So these things really make a difference in many, many ways that will also help save us money in other programs with incarceration or other things that are incredibly costly. When you look at the cost of incarceration, per person per day, this is pennies on the dollar. And I would ask for your green vote. Senator Murphy. Mr. President, uh, I work one way or another every day in early childhood education trying to promote it. So uh, I rise in support of this bill until I can find a better one. I applaud portions of this bill, especially those which include community consensus to apply for the grant, an increase in money which follows students of greater financial need, as well as attempts to include parents in their four-year-old's education. They need to know what's developmentally appropriate. I was a, you know, a parent of young children at one point, and as a lifelong educator, I didn't have a clue. But my wife, of course, being a kindergarten teacher, knew what to do with the kids. So it does, it's great for parents to be involved, and I really agree with uh, my friend from District 29 that has concerns about, uh, about parents being involved. And, and he's absolutely right. You can't beat the influence of a good parent. And so if you're a good parent and you want to keep your child at home, do that. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with people who, like, like the carrier said, 80% of them are working. The world has changed. If you can't keep your child at home and you have this opportunity, it's tremendous. I feel it's incumbent upon me as one of the prime drivers of early childhood education in this body to recognize the efforts of the, uh, the, efforts of the carrier and the two speakers that followed him, the ones that are involved in the bill. This bill bows to what the Germans would call real politic, which ends with a K. It means the politics of reality. In other words, the limitations of this bill exist because in many ways they must. Please support 2151 to help our future leaders reduce their achievement gap, making it much more likely that someday they will be future leaders. Looking for your green. Thank you. Senator Heckman. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. President. I'm going to ask for a green light this time and make sure I ask for a green light. Um, just a couple of points um, that the senator from District 29 brought up. Um, some hours of parent contact were added into this, making it similar to what gearing up for kindergarten is. And I really think that that's an important component. And if I had my druthers, I would druther that that be in, increased for parents to spend more time in integrating into the program with their children on this early childhood program. But for some families, that's not possible, um, whether they work 
two jobs or three jobs, their hours are, are sporadic, um, they don't always have the same work schedule. And so looking at 10 hours of uh, parental involvement in here I think is important. Uh, and maybe as we go across the, the aisle with this, maybe we can, or across the hall with this, maybe we can increase that parental involvement. And uh, again, reiterating um, from the senator from my right here that um, this is completely voluntary. There is no mandate on this at all, and I think that that's another important factor. So green lights. Further discussion? Hearing none, the question is on the final passage of Senate Bill 2151. Would the secretary please open the key? All senators record your vote. All senators have voted. Any senator wishing to change their vote? Secretary, close the key. Final tally on Senate Bill 2151 reveals 33 senators voting yay, 14 senators voting nay. The bill is passed.